Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. It's very rare that among the annals of ufology, there should appear a UFO case which involved military yet is accompanied by actual photographic proof. Such is the case of an event which took place over the Los Angeles area on February 25, 1942. A giant UFO would actually hover over the city and be witnessed by hundreds of observers. As America was gathering its senses after the shocking attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, there was a heightened feeling of insecurity and anxiousness. The skies were being watched as never before as a giant UFO moved through California, alerting the military and civilian watchers as well. The case is known as the Battle of Los Angeles and is one of the most important cases in ufology. I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the podcast and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you're already a weirdo, please share the podcast with others. Doing so helps make it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Coming up in this episode… Did the light of heaven shine supernaturally onto the body of boxer Lute McCartney when he died in the ring? Thousands of witnesses say yes, as does the photographic evidence. Anna Baker's father would not allow her to marry the man she loved, but that didn't stop her from wearing her wedding dress numerous times before her death. The scary folks over at Graveyard Shift have gathered some creepy stories from real people who have survived some terrifying encounters with the strange and paranormal. We begin with those stories. In 1942, a giant UFO hovered over the city of Los Angeles and was witnessed by military and civilians alike with hundreds of reports of the encounter afterward. Located in the middle of the historic section of Glenwood Cemetery in Mississippi is a grave surrounded by chain links which caretakers are cautious to never allow to break or come loose, but the results might be tragic to those living within the town. Annie Goodwin had been living with the family of John Traffigan for the last two years, but now she was missing, and a conversation overheard by a man indicated something gruesome may have happened at the hands of her very own doctor. A very angry woman in a wedding dress terrorizes motorists in the Czech Republic. Plus, weirdo family member Samuel Bayet tells us about his childhood home in Texas and some of the strange things that happened there. While listening, be sure to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com you can sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, watch old horror movies for free. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. A few years ago, I was living in a fairly nice apartment complex, having a cigarette on my balcony around 3 a.m. on a Tuesday night. I'm usually on my phone, but I get this weird chill and looked up to see a middle-aged man walking down the sidewalk across the complex. It struck me that he did not belong here, 
and I realized he wasn't one of our residents. As I was thinking this, he suddenly stopped and looked right at me, making eerie, way too long eye contact, and then rushed off between buildings in the opposite direction of my apartment. I told my husband about it and joked that if we get a knock on our door in the next 15 minutes, we can assume it's that creeper. Sure enough, 10 minutes later, there is this quiet, faint tap, tap, tap on our door. My eyes probably popped out of my head, and my husband jumped up to grab his gun from the other room. I slowly walked up to the door to look through the peephole, holding my breath, and there was the man that I had seen looking right at me through the peephole. I know he wasn't able to actually see me, but the image of him looking right into my eye still freaks me out to this day. My husband walked up to the door, stared through the peephole, and shouted, What? in his threatening voice. Apparently, the man had his hand on the doorknob and jerked back in surprise to hear a man's voice. Dude asked for Jeremy or some made-up name, and my husband told him to leave. After messing around a little longer, the guy finally walked downstairs, only to peer up into my living room window from the lawn. I closed the blinds, and he moved over to stare at me through the balcony door. He didn't move on until after I shut that one too. We called security and gave a clear description and everything. A few days later, we got a report from our complex that an apartment had been robbed around that same time of the night. What keeps me up at night is this question. If you're going to rob an apartment, why would you go to do that on one that you definitely know somebody's awake and home in? My bedroom is on the second floor of the house. There's no patio, porch, overhang of any kind beneath my windows. A couple years ago, I was watching TV in bed around 2 a.m. and heard a louder-than-usual animal sound. Not uncommon to hear squirrels running around on the roof from time to time, didn't think much of it, kept on happening, and started to sound awfully close to the window, not on the roof. I ignored it for a pretty long time. After at least 40 to 45 minutes of being irritated by the noise, I banged on the wall in hopes of scaring off whatever it was so I could get some sleep. Just two quick bangs with my fist, which were answered with two bangs on the wall right next to the second-story window from outside. Needless to say, I just about crapped my pants and jumped out of bed. Now, my living room has a bay window and is on the other end of the house, so I could take a look out that window from the side and see my bedroom window. So I hustled downstairs to peek out. I see a guy standing in front of my house below my bedroom window. He's got a knife, a small pocket knife in his hand, and he's petting the front of my house. I call the police and wait. He never leaves the front of the house, even when they roll up and ultimately disarm and arrest him without much of a struggle. The Amy Bradley Disappearance She disappeared from a cruise ship en route to Caraco in 1998, and years later photos were emailed to her parents that very much resembled her and looked like she'd been sold into sex slavery. Multiple people have also claimed to see her through the years. The Wikipedia page on her case lists the sightings and there's an FBI missing persons report including sketches of people that she was seen with in 2005. The whole story is just chilling and terrifying. We moved into a new house a few months ago. As we were in the process of purchasing the home, the renter who was living in it died unexpectedly of natural causes in his mid-40s. He died right in the middle of the living room. Shortly after, we move into the house, and almost immediately our two-year-old daughter starts talking about the ghost that lives in our house. Now, let's be real here. She is two, and two-year-olds are very impressionable. Halloween had recently passed, and she had this Halloween-themed picture book that she loved to read, so it is entirely possible that all of this talk of ghosts was just coming from looking through that book on a regular basis. Still, she was always telling me that the ghost was in her playhouse in the basement, or that the ghost was on the stairs, or that the ghost was standing in the corner. She never seemed to be afraid of the ghost and actually considered him to be her friend, so I wasn't all that concerned, even if there really was a ghost haunting our house. If he's a nice and helpful ghost, it could certainly be a lot worse. 
I would often tell the ghost that he was welcome to stay if he wanted to, but he was also welcome to go if that would make him happier. I was about 3070 on the ghost being real and she could see and talk to him versus the ghost being just in her imagination fueled by her Halloween book. Until one day, when we were going out to the car to go to daycare in the morning. It was still dark out and rainy. My daughter told me that the ghost was on the back deck and that she told me today was the ghost's birthday and she wanted to sing him happy birthday. Once again, I mostly disregarded what she was saying, as she is birthday-obsessed and has in the past made us sing happy birthday to Mickey Mouse, a bowl of fruit snacks, even the bathroom. So we sang and wished the ghost a happy birthday and went on with our lives. Later that day, out of pure curiosity, I looked up the obituary of the man who had died in our house. And wouldn't you know it, that day was his birthday. A 58-year-old man living alone in Japan started hearing noises at night and noticing things out of place in his house. He installed video cameras. Turns out a homeless man had been living in his attic and cupboards for almost a year in his house, undetected. I lived in an apartment a few years ago. Four units upstairs, four units downstairs. I lived upstairs and the apartment below me was vacant. I kept hearing footsteps through the apartment, though, and I knew I shouldn't have. Nobody was supposed to be downstairs. I asked somebody to come over and listen just to see if I was crazy. Maybe I'm just hearing other apartments since it's empty downstairs and everything's just echoing. Wrong. I kept hearing the footsteps. This went on for a solid hour. Finally, I called the landlord and the police. Apparently, someone had broken in through the windows downstairs and was walking back and forth through the apartment with a knife. It was horrifying. I saw something on National Geographic a while ago about the murders of albinos in Tanzania. There was one case of a family with two albino sisters, one of which had her arms and legs hacked off in the middle of the night to sell on the black market. The other albino girl laid next to her sister for the remainder of the night as her sister bled to death. They live in a very secluded hut with no electricity. Albino limbs are reportedly worth a lot in certain parts of Africa for use in traditional witchcraft. I was with my wife and children driving to a local Walgreens when my wife suddenly stopped the car and pointed into the street. I looked and saw two young children in the middle of the road in diapers, wandering around and looking confused. My wife ran out as I stayed in the car with my kids, picked up the smaller one, and took the hand of the older one to walk them into the parking lot of the Walgreens. Up close, I could tell that both diapers were horribly soiled, as in not changed in days. They were both dirty and smelled awful. It was fairly cold and was raining some, so the children were also cold and shivering. We immediately called the police and waited with the children until they arrived. The younger child was approximately two years old, and my wife comforted him. He just kind of laid there and looked happy to be getting some attention. The older child was about four or five and, as I stated, was still in a diaper. He couldn't speak and looked very frightened of anyone getting near him. He would grunt and whimper but seemed to have no way to communicate at all despite his age. I had to gently keep him in the area as he was trying to run off but finally got him to calm down by wrapping a warm blanket around him and humming to him. The cops arrived after about 10 or 15 minutes and took our statement of what had happened. We told them our story, continuing to comfort the children until a team of paramedics got to the scene to make sure the kids didn't need medical attention for exposure, hypothermia, etc. After a while, maybe an hour after we had first found them, a strung-out woman wanders onto the scene and says casually that the children are hers. She's obviously high and tries claiming to the cops that the children were only gone for five or ten minutes. The cop called her on her bull story and spent the next couple of minutes yelling, asking her how she could let her children wander a fairly busy street almost naked in the rain and cold. A man who identifies himself as their dad arrived, shirtless and filthy, also strung out. The cop asked why the older boy was not speaking, and they said he never did, not elaborating why that was. 
When asked where they live, they told conflicting stories, obviously trying to lie to the cop to make it seem the children had not wandered far, but from what it seemed, they lived at least several blocks away. The mom tried to take the children, but the police stepped in and told her that they were in police care now and would be assessed by a CPS rep at the police station before they'd be able to return home. Not long after that, we were told that we could go as they gathered all they needed from us. I never found out what happened to those kids. I hope they got the help they obviously needed. I'm still bothered by the whole event. I wonder what kind of life they led to leave them filthy, mute, and alone in the middle of a city street. I drove past a car on my way to class in college. I always took the back roads to avoid traffic, so it was a bit odd to have a car parked on the side of the road. When I came back from class, it was still there. I drove by a bit more slowly and saw what I thought was someone sleeping in there. I thought that was odder still, but maybe someone was traveling and decided to pull off to take a rest and just fell asleep longer than they'd planned. Nope. Next morning, I read in the paper a wife killed her husband and dumped his body and the car on that back road. Occasionally, I get mild bouts of insomnia. Nothing serious, usually just a delay in my bedtime of an extra couple or three hours. One night, I suddenly just cannot sleep. Nothing will get me to relax, and I eventually give up and just sit in the front room playing heavy rain all night as if it had come out a few days ago. The next day, when I head off to work exhausted with zero hours of sleep, I got a text from my roommate. Dude, the police are all over the apartment complex. Apparently, nine apartments, including our downstairs neighbor, were broken into last night, with people still at home sleeping. Some people even reported things being stolen from the rooms they were sleeping in. It hit me that, had I not stayed up all night and left the light on in the front room, we probably would have been robbed. Or worse. Centralia, Pennsylvania It was a pretty decent-sized coal mining town, and in the 60s, a fire, which I believe was started at a landfill but was not put out completely, caught an exposed coal vein on fire, and the fire burns underground up to this day. In the 80s, the government started paying people to leave and buying up all the land and destroying the houses so nobody would live there. Since they didn't exactly force people to leave, the town still has a population of about 10 people. There's still enough coal underground to keep the fire burning for a very long time. I've been there before, and in person it is really eerie. It's a bunch of empty streets with one or two houses, a church, and some cemeteries. One part of the highway, which was closed off and rerouted because of the fire, is all cracked and misshapen so the road is really uneven. One of the weirdest things is the steam that comes out through the ground. It almost looks like little hot springs everywhere, but it's really all coming from the fire below. I was out in the middle of nowhere at a musical conference my wife was presenting held at an old church retreat camp. One of her presentations ran way over, so the lodge's cafeteria was closed. With no car, no phone, this area was so remote there was no coverage for mobile, and no vending machines, the only resort was to walk into the nearest town and get food. I grabbed a coat and flashlight and had no issue on the trip down, snagged a pizza from a spot along the highway around midnight. On the way back, it was a different story. I got a severe feeling of discomfort. I could feel eyes on me. This was out in the middle of the woods, so my first instinct is there's an animal following me. Knowing most predators like to hit from either above or behind, I turned on my phone light and kept it pointed behind me and swept my flashlight up and down as I walked. The whole walk back, I heard rustlings, first along one side, then following behind. I kept a steady pace and acted cool, even though I was terrified. Shortly before I was back on site, the feeling left. No more sounds. My wife and I enjoyed pizza and slept in. Two days later, we got a shock from the news. A homeless woman was found less than 1,500 yards from our site that had been mauled and partially consumed in what appeared to be a cougar attack. Estimates of the time of death 
were the same night I went out for pizza. When I was in fifth grade, some guy who was mentally ill had a meltdown somewhere in Chicago. Apparently, he shot and killed some random guy and stole his car. He drove up I-94 towards my suburb, got off the highway, and drove straight into my neighborhood. It's very close to the exit and just started shooting sporadically at people's houses. He somehow wound up in my backyard, which is full of trees, and was just shooting in every direction. I can still vividly remember brake lights in the middle of the otherwise pitch black woods and sparks from the gunfire going off in every direction. The cops showed up and shot him to death. Luckily, no one else was hurt, but my neighbors did find a bullet in the middle of their mattress. A few days ago, my iPhone would not accept my fingerprint for Touch ID, any of my fingerprints. My dog stayed on the other side of the apartment from me and wouldn't take any treats from me. I trained him not to take treats from anyone except me to avoid poisoning or illness, but he wouldn't even take his favorite treats from me or cuddle with me. When I went to hug him, he hid in his kennel. My PIN number didn't work for my debit card, so I wound up running it as credit. I used the same PIN for everything. The only websites I could get into were Reddit, Gmail, and Amazon, pages where my password is stored. Any website where I had to enter username and password, it kept coming back as incorrect. Thank God there's no password to wake my computer up, or I wouldn't have been able to do any work that day. The next day, though, everything was back to normal. Working as a 911 dispatcher, I got a call from a house. Call it back. It's been disconnected. This is actually fairly common and happened whenever it rained. The backstory on the house is that it was vacant and used to have an active landline. The theory was that the water was somehow getting to the telephone system to the house and was setting off false alarms. Well, we get one, and I thought about just saying screw it, but I stuck with protocol and sent an officer anyway. Good thing. The vacant house had just caught on fire. The day after a rainstorm. Never found a witness, and the house was saved. It was winter break, freshman year of college. I drove up to visit one of my friends in northwestern Pennsylvania for New Year's. I needed to be back home the next day for work, so I decided to drive back at like 2 a.m. I was driving down Interstate 79 and maybe saw two cars in a 60-mile span. I came up around a bend and saw what looked like a black bear in my lane, and I swerved and went off the road and crashed into a tree line next to the highway. I was in the middle of nowhere, and the bear just booked it into the woods. My car was totaled, and I knew I wasn't going to see any cars for hours to help me out. I called 911, and they said that they would come in like 20 minutes. I got out of the car and stood up on the shoulder of the highway and waited. After about five minutes, I heard some rustling in the bushes, and there it was, the bear. Turns out when I went off the road, I hit a cub, and Mama Bear was ticked off. I booked it over to the back of the car and hopped in the trunk. Thank goodness I had a big Ford Expedition so the bear couldn't mess with it too much. For another half an hour, the bear tried ramming the car and was trying to get to me in a frenzy. The police showed up and the sirens scared Mama Bear off into the woods again. It was the most terrifying experience of my life. I grew up in a forestry cottage miles away from any town. We often got toads and birds and other woodland creatures in the house out of the blue. I was seven at the time and suffered from night terrors. My parents would often find me about the house at night speaking nonsense or screaming. Must have freaked them out to no end. For a few nights, I had been shouting at my parents, convinced there was something in my bed. I couldn't sleep because of it, but obviously my parents put it down to nightmares. I kept saying something was shaking in my bed and scratching me, so they took all my blankets and toys out to show me there was nothing there, but I was still convinced. I was an odd child, so people often thought I was just making things up. Turns out a bat had gotten into the duvet cover. I opened it up one night and this thing flew out. My parents ran in and turned the light on to find this bat dinging around the room. Sometimes I'm still woken up by that feeling that there's a bat in my blanket. 
My great aunt died in August of 2012. Six months later, in February of 2013, my cousin was playing in a hockey tournament. He was extremely close to our aunt and was pretty devastated by the loss. His team was never that good. However, in this particular tournament, they were doing really well, so well that they made it to the finals. They lost, but that's where fate comes into play. All of the runner-up trophies were wrapped in newspaper. My cousin pulled a trophy out of the box, and the single piece of paper wrapped around it was my aunt's obituary from six months earlier. Years ago, around Halloween, my family had gathered to watch scary movies. My mom loved these things. My dad didn't care much for them, though, so he'd get up every few minutes to go work on something or other. We'd started watching Hitchcock's The Birds, and it was getting late, probably close to midnight, and it was getting cold. Not just the late October chill of the foothills we lived in, the house itself was getting cold. At first my mom just asked my dad to turn up the thermostat, but after a couple of minutes of the furnace running and the house still not warming up, he realized he needed to go check the furnace. He grabbed a lighter and headed downstairs. A minute later we hear him shout for us to come down. You have to come see this, he says, with something that sounds part excitement, part nervousness in his voice. We get down there to see him shining a flashlight into the furnace. Peering in, first we just noticed the pilot light was indeed out. But then we saw the reason. A dead bird. Something about the size of the palm of my hand, maybe a sparrow, had flown into the furnace from outside and put the flame out. Up next, did the light of heaven shine supernaturally onto the body of boxer Luke McCartney when he died in the ring? Thousands of witnesses say yes, as does the photographic evidence. And Anna Baker's father would not allow her to marry the man she loved, but that did not stop her from wearing her wedding dress numerous times before her death. These stories are coming up. Hey Weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with Weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm going to take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night, August 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch. Just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members, and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata, this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! The six-foot-four-inch Luther McCarty was a talented young boxer and actually ended up making his full professional debut at the tender age of 18. This debut fight took place on the 7th of January 1911, and his opponent was a guy named Watt Adams. Luther managed to demolish him within two rounds. Over the next 12 months, Luther skyrocketed to stardom as he smashed through every fighter put in front of him the public began to pin the nickname of Loot on him. Such was the dominance of Loot that a championship bout was arranged for New Year's Day 1913. This big-time main event was to be against a fighter named Al Pauser, the white world heavyweight champion. 
Pelzer was absolutely smashed during the fight, but managed to get out of it with a TKO. He handed over his belt to loot. The boxing community went wild with this win, and promoters started to battle to set up a legendary fight between Loot and Jack Johnson. But this fight never took place. Before his big fight with Johnson, Loot took part in a sort of warm-up match against a fighter named Arthur Pelkey. This fight should have been fairly routine for a boxer of Loot's quality. In the very first round of the fight, Loot took a rather feeble punch to the heart area and collapsed instantly. He lay motionless on the floor as the referee counted him out. The referee, Ed Smith, started to panic. Something was not quite right here. Medical professionals jumped into the ring and tried their best to revive the famous fighter, but it was no use. After eight minutes, Loot was pronounced dead. As Loot lay on the boxing ring canvas being counted out, the 6,000-strong crowd all witnessed an amazing paranormal light beam down on the stricken boxer's body. The light seemed to hit him as the referee started to count, then disappear as soon as the count was over. The shaft of light seemed to be the perfect size to cover only Loot's body. There's only one photo image of this strange light, the photo used for the cover art of this Weird Darkness episode, and it's been debated ever since by thousands of skeptics. Most of these people believe the photo to have been somehow faked, but just over 6,000 people at that fight also personally witnessed this heavenly light. A coroner's report later determined that the cause of Lute's death was probably linked to a horse-riding accident that he had suffered just days before the fight took place. So what was this strange light? Was it an ethereal sign from a higher power calling Lute home? The perfect man, the perfect dress, what more could a girl ask for? How about her father's approval? In 1836, Elias Baker and his cousin Roland Diller bought the Allegheny Furnace in Altoona, Blair County, Pennsylvania. This iron furnace would help them amass a fortune from the rich iron deposits in the area. Elias moved his wife Hetty and their two sons, David Woods and Sylvester, from Lancaster County all the way to Altoona into a mansion near the furnace. Shortly thereafter, Hetty bore a daughter, Anna, and another girl, Margareta, in 1839. Unfortunately, Margareta died after just two short years. In 1844, Elias bought out his cousin's share in the furnace, and then, in 1845, construction began on his new home, the Baker Mansion, which was completed in 1849. Elias was a very proud man and ruled his family with an iron fist. Little did he know his only daughter, Anna, had fallen in love with one of his employees, a lowly steelworker. She and the steelworker planned to marry in secret. She even had the dress. But her father discovered their hidden love affair, and he forbade her to marry him. Taking after her father, Anna was stubborn and fought long and hard. She didn't care about the comforts money brought her. She did not care about fine clothing or jewelry. She didn't need a big fancy home. Her mother Hetty fought for her daughter, praising the man Anna wished to marry. Unfortunately, Elias would not listen, and it was then that Anna made the decision to remain single for the rest of her life. Elias didn't give up, though, and he brought her suitor after suitor. She denied them all, letting her anger win over any chance at happiness. The dress Anna had purchased had once belonged to Elizabeth Bell, the daughter of another iron master in the area. Elizabeth mocked Anna for never being married. By the time Elias Baker died in 1848, it was too late, and Anna's love had moved on. She remained alone in the house, angry and bitter. But there were those occasions when the servants of the household would spot her wearing her wedding dress and dancing under the moonlight until she died in 1914. It is widely known that the Baker Mansion is haunted, the county purchased the mansion in 1941 and turned it into a museum. Anna's wedding dress was put on display in what used to be her bedroom. Staff at the museum have noticed the dress moving within its glass case. When the moon is full, 
the dress would strike violently on the glass case. Some believe the movement of the wedding dress and the glass case can be attributed to old historical floorboards being weak or loose. Others say it's nothing more than drafts. A study was conducted to find out the real reason behind the movement of the dress. Cameras were aimed at the glass case, and when no one was present in the museum, the dress could still be seen moving. It must be Anna's spirit living within the dress, or trying to get to it. Those same cameras also captured spectral forms and images of a bitter old woman in front of the mirror. Furniture had been spotted moving, and the sound of footsteps have also been heard. A music box left in one of the rooms could be heard playing when no one was present inside the room. The spirit of Elias has been spotted in the dining room as well, while a woman in a black dress believed to be Hetty has been spotted on the third floor. Anna's brother, David Baker, was killed in the steamboat accident in 1852. His body was stored in one of the rooms until the frozen ground had thawed enough for him to have a proper burial. People have reported hearing screams coming from that very room. Today, the Baker Mansion is still open to the public. However, Anna Baker's wedding dress is no longer on permanent display due to deterioration caused by exposure to light and airborne pollutants. It would be early morning, February 2, 1942, when the incoming craft sirens were first heard in the Los Angeles area. Many Americans were expecting another wave of Japanese fighter planes and thought this is what they would see as they left their homes and ventured outside. How wrong they were. The first sightings of a large UFO would be made in Culver City and Santa Monica. Air raid wardens were ready to go at the first hint of an invasion. But this invasion would be something other than Japanese planes. The giant hovering object was soon lit up by the gigantic spotlights of the Army's 37th Coast Artillery Brigade. Everyone who looked up was shocked by the sight of a giant UFO sitting above their city. Military aircraft were sent to confront the object. Because of a well-organized alert system, the whole California southern section was searching the night skies in a matter of minutes. What they saw were beaming searchlights illuminating the night sky, all of them converging on one thing – a UFO. A similar scene would be repeated later during the Norwood searchlight incident, albeit on a smaller scale. The beams of light would soon be accompanied by tracer fire from anti-aircraft artillery, all of the rounds aiming at the invading craft. The giant UFO would take direct hit after direct hit, yet would do so without any damage. The 37th Brigade was relentless in its attempt to bring down the large object, but found no success. The barrage of spent shells would fall over the entire area. No place was safe this night. Many were injured, and there were even reports of death from the falling shells. According to newspaper reports, eyewitnesses described the sight of the UFO like a surreal, hanging magic lantern. As the large UFO moved into more lighted areas, views of the object became better. It moved directly over the MGM Studios in Culver City. Fortunately, an extremely good quality photograph was taken of the object beams attached, tracer fire visible. The photo has become a classic UFO photograph. The UFO would soon move over Long Beach before disappearing altogether. A female air raid warden gave testimony saying, "...it was huge. It was just enormous, and it was practically right over my house." I had never seen anything like it in my life," she said. It was just hovering there in the sky and hardly moving at all. It was a lovely pale orange and about the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. I could see it perfectly because it was very close. It was big. Other witnesses reported, They sent fighter planes up and I watched them in groups approach it and then turn away. They were shooting at it, but it didn't seem to matter. It was like the 4th of July, but much louder. They were firing like crazy, but they couldn't touch it. I'll never forget what a magnificent sight it was, just marvelous, and what a gorgeous color. The giant invading airship was now gone, and the citizenry of the Southern California area began to resume normal activities. 
it was an extremely important event, one that will not be soon forgotten. Only news of the war kept this from becoming a major news event. The case must have been in the mind of President Ronald Reagan when he warned us of an alien threat from outside of our world. Located in the middle of the historic section of Glenwood Cemetery of Yahoo City is a grave surrounded by chain links known as the Witch's Grave. The legend of the Witch of Yazoo became famous in Willie Morris's book Good Old Boy, published in 1971. This story is an example of the unusual folklore surrounding Yazoo County. Many have pointed out that the grave and the legend were there long before Morris was born, and that the chain had been broken for a long time. According to legend, the old woman lived on the Yazoo River and was caught torturing fishermen who she lured in off the river. The sheriff is said to have chased her through the swamps, where she was half drowned in quicksand by the time the sheriff caught up with her. As she was sinking, she swore her revenge on Yahoo City and on the town's people. In twenty years, she said, I will return and burn this town to the ground. No one thought much of it at the time. Then came May 25, 1904. The fire of 1904 destroyed over 200 residences and nearly every business in Yazoo City, 324 buildings in total. Many theories evolved as to how the fire started, but none were conclusive. The most popular theory is that the fire started in the parlor of a young Miss Wise who was in preparation for her wedding to be held later that day. While this is quite possible and certainly innocent enough, it is the strange and fierce winds that were blowing on that fateful day, unusual for the time, that led many to blame the witch. The flames were said by witnesses to have jumped through the air, as if driven by some supernaturally forceful winds. This is one of the eeriest facts of the story. Area weather reports from May 25, 1904 make no mention of high winds in the area. A group of citizens made their way into Glenwood on the day after the fire and found the large chains around the grave of the witch broken in two. Today, adults and children alike enjoy taking the tour of Glenwood Cemetery and hearing the story of the witch, affectionately named the Chain Lady by many in modern-day Yazoo, as well as the story of many other famous and infamous Yazooans led by costumed storytellers. Many others visit to see the grave by themselves and to enjoy the peace and serenity that can be found only in such a historic resting place as Glenwood Cemetery. Some folks have said that the truth of the witch's grave is that a man is buried there. Make no mistake, there is no evidence of this. In fact, the only record ever to have been found, to our knowledge, shows that a woman owned the plot in Glenwood where the witch's grave is located. Many years ago, the stone, now long gone, which was original to the grave, only had the letters T.W. The witch? The stone, which is now in place, mysteriously fell and split in two shortly after installation. No one knows why for certain. The heavy chains surrounding the grave are constantly being repaired, only to fall apart again shortly after. There is certainly some mysterious force at work here. See for yourself, hear the story, and decide what you believe. Current local lore says that when all the chains are gone from her grave, the witch will return again to exact her revenge on Yazoo City. To this day, the cemetery sextons are very careful to keep the chains repaired and in place, though they often are broken again very soon after being repaired. Up next, any good one had been living with the family of John Traffigan for the last two years, but now she was missing, and a conversation overheard by a man indicated something gruesome may have happened at the hands of her very own doctor. Also, a very angry woman in a wedding dress terrorizes motorists in the Czech Republic. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns.
The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises, the politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. In July 1890, a man came in to the 126th Street Police Station in Harlem, New York City to report a conversation he had overheard in an elevated train. The young man and woman sitting near him were talking about the mysterious disappearance of Miss Goodwin from the Storm King Flats on East 126th Street. They believed that she had been foully dealt with by professional malpractioners. The woman said that a friend told her that Miss Goodwin had died and within 24 hours she was buried and another young woman was wearing her clothes and jewelry. Malpractice was the euphemism that New York papers used for abortion, and at the time a death by malpractice was considered manslaughter. The police decided to investigate. At the Storm King Flats, they learned that Annie Goodwin had been living with the family of John Traffigan for the last two years but she'd been missing since July 2nd. 18-year-old Sadie Traffigan, a close friend of Annie Goodwin, was reluctant to talk to the police, but through her, they learned that Annie had previously lived with her sister Mamie and her husband George Halliday, who also lived on 126th Street. After questioning Mamie Halliday and Sadie Traffigan, the police were able to piece together the story of Annie Goodwin's short life. Annie had been somewhat wild and restless while growing up, and when she was 18, she left the restraints of her father's house and went to live with Mamie and her husband. Annie had a good job as wrapper-cutter in a Manhattan cigarette factory and was living comfortably, but Mamie was concerned about her sister's lifestyle. She'd stay out until 3 in the morning, and some nights she didn't come home at all. Annie Goodwin was considered a rare beauty, a bright-faced, laughing girl of medium height with a well-rounded figure, very dark eyes that sparkled with fun, a mouth that echoed the spirit of her eyes musically, a nose with just a roguish hint of an upward turn, and dark hair worn in a wavy bang. She caught the eye of Augustus Gus Harrison, a young, independently wealthy man about town. Though he was not much to look at, small and thin with a wispy blonde mustache, Annie was flattered by his attention and became infatuated with Gus Harrison. Mamie did not like Harrison and didn't believe his attentions toward Annie were honorable. The late nights out increased, and when he came to call he would sneak in a bottle of wine, trying to hide it from the holidays. Finally, Mamie confronted Annie, telling her to cease associating with Harrison. He must stop coming or she must go live somewhere else. To which Annie responded, very well. I will go somewhere else. 
She went to live with the family of her friend Sadie Traffigan, just one block west of the Hallidays, and stayed there until her disappearance on July 2, 1890. At first, Sadie said she did not know where her friend had gone, but under intense questioning she revealed that Annie had gone to a boarding house on 127th Street, kept by Mrs. John Collins. There, the police learned that Annie had hired an attic bedroom for a week on July 2nd, but only remained there until July 4th. That night, at about 10 o'clock, Mrs. Collins told them that Dr. Henry G. McGonagall drove to the house in his carriage, a two-wheeled gig, and took Annie away. The police were familiar with Dr. McGonagall. He'd been arrested several times in connection with mysterious deaths, but had managed to evade punishment. They were sure Dr. McGonagall was the cause of Annie Goodwin's disappearance. They went at Sadie Traffigan again, and she admitted she'd been aware that Annie was in trouble. She learned that on July 4th, Annie was taken from Mrs. Collins' place to the apartment of Mrs. Fanny Shaw on East 103rd Street. On July 9th or 10th, Sadie received a letter from Annie asking her to call at Mrs. Shaw's. She went and found Annie sick in bed. On July 14th, she went again, and Mrs. Shaw told her that Annie had died and Dr. McGonagall had removed her body. Dr. McGonagall called at Sadie's house several times in the days that followed. He asked if she had any papers with the dead girl's handwriting and requested that Sadie write a note to Mamie, imitating Annie's handwriting over her forged signature, saying she had gone to New Jersey and would return in a month or two. Sadie refused. The police paid a call on Fanny Shaw. She was a 38-years-old, hideous-looking creature being treated for blood poisoning by Dr. McGonagall. Reluctantly, she told a story that mirrored what Sadie had said. The doctor was treating Annie Goodwin in her apartment until the afternoon of July 12th when the girl died. Dr. McGonagall said he would take care of it, and around 2 a.m. Sunday morning, he carried the body wrapped in a quilt over his shoulder downstairs and drove it away in his gig. Checking with the Bureau of Vital Statistics, the police found a recent death certificate bearing the name of Dr. H. G. McGonagall. The document said that Jane Wilbur had died from rheumatism of the heart on July 11th, the day before Annie Goodwin's death. But at the address given on the certificate, no one knew Jane Wilbur, and the police concluded it was a false name. At the undertaker shop of Cornelius Merritt, the books showed that instead of Jane Wilbur, they buried a man named John Wilbur at St. Michael's Cemetery in Astoria. The police believed he buried Annie Goodwin under a false name. Merritt pled ignorance, saying he had taken McGonagall at his word and given the body to his workmen without examining it. This was evidence enough, and the police rounded up everyone involved. They arrested Dr. McGonagall and Fanny Shaw for murder, and Augustus Harrison as an accessory. Sadie Traffigan, Cornelius Merritt, and several others were held as witnesses. In Dr. McGonagall's office, the police found about 30 glass jars containing evidences of malpractice preserved in alcohol, in other words, preserved fetuses. The police believed they had a nice, tight narrative now where Gus Harrison, the author of Annie's Misfortune, hired Dr. McGonagall to perform the operation, and when Annie died, McGonagall had her buried under a false name. The newspapers took it even further, citing the predated death certificate, the New York Herald called it, evidence of a conspiracy to kill as complicated and as boldly carried out as the most fantastic scheme of murder in a French tale. The story took another turn when the police learned that Gus Harrison was not Annie's only romantic interest. Mrs. Collins told them that a young man named Drew visited Annie in the brief time she stayed at Mrs. Collins' boarding house. The newspapers tried to get in front of the police, speculating that the man was T. Oscar Drew, who had checked into the Harlem Hotel at least a dozen times, accompanied by a lady. This was the wrong Drew. Sadie Traffigan told police that Drew was actually the nickname of Andrew L. Fanning, who had been frequently calling on Annie. She said Annie was in love with Gus Harrison, and when she learned that she was in trouble, she begged him to marry her. He absolutely refused. Once Annie accepted this, she was ready to marry Drew Fanning after she had gotten out of trouble. Andrew Fanning turned himself in when he learned that the police were looking for him. 
He said that he had met Annie Goodwin on the street about six months earlier and had fallen desperately in love with her. He had proposed marriage, and she accepted. But the Annie Goodwin that Fanning knew was quite different from the one everyone else knew. He believed her to be innocent and pure, almost prudish. She would chastise him if he let slip an unrefined word, and at the theater he saw her blush at an off-color remark. Fanning would frequently visit her at the Traffigans and became disconsolate when she suddenly disappeared. On July 4th, he received a note from Annie. Dear Drew, come to me at once. I am very sick at number 152 East 127th Street. Signed, Annie. He found her in her room, suffering dreadfully, and wanted to go at once for the nearest doctor. She said she would have no other physician but Dr. McGonagall and gave him the doctor's address. Fanning brought the doctor to her and left. He never saw her again. Andrew Fanning was arrested as an accessory and held on $2,500 bail. The Wilbur body in St. Michael's Cemetery was disinterred. It's unclear whether the grave was marked John or Joan. Half naked, she lay face down in the coffin as if she had been thrown in. Sadie Traffigan and Mamie Halliday both identified the body as that of Annie Goodwin. A coroner's jury heard testimony from everyone involved and charged Dr. H. G. McGonagall and Fanny Shaw with manslaughter. Augustus Harrison was charged as an accessory. The focus was on Dr. McGonagall, and at his trial the following September, he was found guilty of first-degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison but received a stay pending appeal. He remained in the tombs until the following April when he was released on $5,000 bail. This was the extent of his punishment for Annie Goodwin's death. It would not be his last arrest for death by malpractice. The tale of an unhappy female ghost causing havoc for motorists on the highway is almost universal. There is one in the Czech Republic, but she is not the victim of a recent car crash like so many of the others. She was the bride at a 16th century wedding that ended in a massacre. The place has been called Nine Crosses for as long as anyone can remember, and tall wooden crosses still stand by the side of the turnoff where the nine victims were buried. The site is a protected cultural monument. The spot is just off the D1 highway from Prague to Brno, the busiest road in the country. For years, tabloids have been pointing out that the fatal accident rate near Exit 168 by the village of Lesni Hlubok, about 25 kilometers west of Brno, South Moravia, is higher than average, and perhaps the bride's ghost is to blame. The area just under an overpass for Exit 168 is where the white-shrouded ghost is supposed to appear frightening motorists into losing control of their cars. An old trade route for horse-drawn carts stood at the site long before Exit 168 was opened in 1973. The curse has been in place for almost five centuries, according to supporters of the tale. A wedding was planned in 1540 at the village of Lesni Hulbok, which means the Forest Deep. The town had existed since at least 1395 and likely is much older. The story starts a year earlier, in 1539. A peasant from Forest Deep was returning from the market from a neighboring big town when he saw a wounded Hungarian horse merchant on the road. The peasant brought the merchant home and healed his wounds. The peasant had a very beautiful daughter who helped to look after the wounded merchant. The two, being young, fell in love with each other. The girl's father, though, had different ideas. He wanted his daughter to marry a wealthy person so the family could improve its standing. This was a time when marriages were often still arranged. The father sent the merchant to Hungary to do some business deals, and if he returned wealthy after a year, then he would consent to the wedding. This was just meant to get rid of the merchant, though. The father hoped he would have another accident and never return, or fall in love at home like people are supposed to do. Another version says the merchant left on his own, having agreed with the daughter about a secret wedding on his return. But the tale soon takes a dark turn. 
the son of a rich local family became interested in the beautiful young woman, just as the father had originally hoped. The parents on both sides were in favor of the marriage, and the daughter was left out of the discussions. The girl's father set aside any thought of the promise to the Hungarian merchant and forced his daughter into the arranged marriage. Somehow, word got to the merchant. Either the daughter managed to send a message or some other merchant sent word out as part of a code of merchant courtesy. Perhaps he simply returned because the year was up. The Hungarian merchant was not happy at being jilted, and he wasted no time in planning his revenge. At a local inn, he talked a friend, perhaps the local gamekeeper, into helping him punish the wedding party, but the bride was to be spared. They would ambush from secret and not be seen. Perhaps he thought he could emerge as the hero, pretend to fight off the assailants and rescue his widowed loved one. Maybe he thought he would console the grieving widow and marry her after a brief mourning period. Whatever his plan was, it went astray. The happy wedding procession was returning from the church without a clue that the merchant had returned and was laying in wait. At the crossroads, in front of the village, the merchant and the gamekeeper opened fire. There were seven killed on the scene. The dead included the bride and bridegroom, the bride's father, the witness, and three other women including bridesmaids. Guns were not very accurate then and it was easy to hit the wrong target. When the merchant saw that his beloved was among the dead, he turned his anger against the gamekeeper, blaming him for the stray bullet. He shot the gamekeeper in anger and either the gamekeeper lived long enough to shoot back or he took his own life, knowing there was no way out. The nine dead were buried at the spot. Crosses were put up by the Benedictine monks from the nearby monastery, and for a long time they were reconsecrated every 100 years to pacify the souls of the nine dead. The last reconsecration was September 18, 1887, meaning that 1987 the souls had not been appeased. The wooden crosses have been replaced several times. Tabloid newspaper accounts say the bride, dressed in white, now appears standing in the middle of the D1 highway by the exit 168 overpass, causing drivers to swerve. Other accounts talk of a pair of black wings that swoop down on windshields, causing the driver to panic. One writer for a mainstream newspaper even talks of the Demosev Triangle, an area that includes nine crosses, which has several unexplained road accidents. The White Bride appears most often to those who are planning to get married or driving to or from a wedding. One accident involved a couple on their way from Brno to Prague to catch a flight for their Caribbean honeymoon. The injured driver, who swerved without reason, is supposed to have told his wife, I saw her. She was there. The Bride. This story is from weirdo family member Samuel Bayet. Here's what he says. When I was younger, I was living in a house in Texas. The street was called Peavy, an older two-floor house but from the outside didn't look any different from most houses there. We lived there for quite some time and in the years I spent there, several odd things took place. One day the sun was shining, I didn't really want to go outside because it was so hot I just stayed indoors and played games and whatnot. That was when I heard creaking in the back rooms, the rooms that me and my sister slept in. I was in the house by myself. My uncle was outside on the porch and everyone else had left earlier that morning, so I thought I must have been hearing things. I walked over to the hallway doors and looked through the center of them, suddenly wishing I hadn't, because I saw this older woman with a walker leaving my sister's room and going upstairs to my room. I was so afraid at the time I didn't even go back to see if maybe it was just something hanging off of the door. That same night, I was hanging out with my sister in her room when the old radio we had turned on by itself and started playing some quite creepy music. We both freaked out and I ran over and unplugged it from the wall, rushing back over to my sister only to have the thing turn itself back on again anyway. I thought maybe it was because of the batteries that were in it, so I rushed over and flipped it upside down, quickly removing the cover, only to find there were no batteries in the stupid thing. 
In a panic, I ran over to my sister and sat on the bed with her terrified when my dad and mom walked in, getting angry at us for having it on. When we explained what happened, they looked at each other quite seriously and then picked up the radio, leaving the room with it. We never saw the radio again after that. A couple weeks later, we were upstairs and As I was laying there, I heard what sounded like glass sliding across something, and when I looked at where the sound was coming from, one of my biggest fears came true. My sister's porcelain doll was slowly moving across the room towards us, the only thing touching the floor being the tips of the doll's feet. After that incident, it wasn't until much later when we started hearing faint knocking sounds throughout the house, mostly at the stairs headed upstairs into my room that was when it truly started going downhill. Every time me and my sister would go up there, a different group of items would be thrown across the room like someone had been looking for something, got infuriated that they couldn't find it, and just threw things around until one day my entire room and my sister's room were a complete disaster. Not long after this started happening, we ended up moving, leaving the house behind. I've never been back to it since. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast and you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so now so you don't miss future episodes. And also, please, tell someone else about the podcast. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. 1942's Battle of Los Angeles was written by Billy Booth for Live About. The Chained Witch was posted at visityazoo.org. Professional Malpractioner was written by Robert Wilhelm for Murder by Gaslight. The Ghost Bride of Nine Crosses is by Raymond Johnston for Magic Bohemia. Haunting on Peavy Street was written by weirdo family member Samuel Bayett. People Who Survived Real-Life Horror Stories was gathered by Rosa Pascarella for Graveyard Shift. Did the Light of Heaven Shine Down on Boxer Luther McCarty is from Real Paranormal Experiences and Anna Baker's wedding dress is from The Scare Chamber. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. And a final thought by Maya Angelou it's paraphrased, but I like the thought. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes and discomfort it has gone through to achieve that beauty. The same can be said of us. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. (laughs) 